The world's best investors, in many cases, built their riches through making a series of intelligent value investments. Whether in stocks, bonds, real estate, or private businesses, they always look to accumulate assets below their underlying value, that is, their intrinsic value. And over the years, the hunt for undervalued assets has changed. Back in the 1950s, it was really a case of simply actually looking. If you take Warren Buffett, for example, he would sit there and flip through page after page of Moody's manuals, looking for quantitatively cheap and undervalued stocks. As markets continued to develop and become more competitive, it was no longer an informational edge that gave investors an advantage, but rather it was an analytical edge. Again, using Warren Buffett as an example, he found great success investing in media companies like Cap City's ABC and the Washington Post. And in part when looking at those companies, Warren Buffett had an analytical advantage. It wasn't until 1988 that the US formally required companies to actually publish a cash flow statement. However, years before that, Warren Buffett had recognized that these businesses threw off far more cash flow than their reported earnings might suggest. But as competition becomes greater and as skilled financial analysts are seemingly around every corner, many investors believe that the most lucrative edge to have in markets today is a behavioral one. More specifically, participating in something called time arbitrage, simply making long-term investments in a very short-term focused stock market world. We hear it all the time from the world's best investors. Seth Klarman of Balpost Group, for example, said the single greatest edge an investor can have is a long-term orientation. Joel Greenblatt, who in the early days of his fund generated 50% per year returns, said the last man standing is going to be time arbitrage. And David Einhorn recently said, I think one of the inefficiencies in the market is investors are generally too short-term oriented, and time arbitrage is one of the best inefficiencies in the market. In this video, let's look at what I think is the absolute poster child for short-term investors dumping a stock that had good long-term prospects, and where long-term focused investors who were willing to stomach a little bit of short-term pain were able to generate great returns by simply having a longer term view than the average stock market participant or in other words participating in time arbitrage. If you enjoyed this video and haven't subscribed to the Investing with Tom channel already please be sure to do so but with all that said let's get straight into the video. Now in my mind the poster child for a good business that experienced a short-term problem that created an opportunity for a long-term investor is a business called Gildan Activewear. And the story of Gildan is one that I actually first heard from Phil Town of Rule One Investing. I've heard him talk through the story a number of times. And the story, as Phil Town tells it, is actually from back in 2011 or 2012. But still through to this day, it's one of the best, cleanest examples of a short-term event a company ran into that was kind of out of their control that created a great opportunity for the long-term investor. And Phil Town himself actually took advantage of the opportunity in Gildan Activewear at the time and uh, presumably profited handsomely from it as well. Now Gildan is a good but somewhat cyclical business. Uh, they are a largely a global leader at this point in producing basic clothing. And long-term investors in Gildan Activewear have had a pretty good experience. Had you bought Gildan shortly after it went public at the end of 1998 and held it through to today and reinvested your dividends, you would have generated 19.4% compounded returns for over 25 years. Uh, that's against 6.99% for the S&P 500 over the same period of time. Uh, that sort of outperformance versus the S&P 500 is enough to turn a $10,000 investment in Gildan Activewear into $737,000 uh, by today. That's about 14 and a half times more money than you would have had you put that same $10,000 into the S&P 500. Today, that would be worth about $51,000. Of course, by definition, a good business is one that earns a high return on invested capital and Gildan is no exception. It earns sort of a high teens uh, return on invested capital. On average, it is somewhat cyclical, so that return on invested capital goes up and down, but it averages out 
out in sort of the high teens. The return on equity is a little higher. Gildan does have some leverage built in. And for that reason, return on equity tends to be closer to about 20% on average. And you'd love to see it. Gildan Activewear has the same CEO as when it went public in 1998. And he personally today has about a $100 million personal stake uh, in terms of his stock holding in Gildan Activewear. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Gildan is somewhat cyclical. And that's really how we arrive at our story of a short-term event that caused a great opportunity for long-term investors. And Gildan is not cyclical in the typical sense of the word. They're not like an oil company where uh, revenue goes up and down wildly just based on the price of oil. We'll take Occidental Petroleum as an example of that. Uh, the revenue growth over time for Gildan, um, despite a couple of lumps here and there, has actually been pretty consistent over the years. Now what isn't so stable in the case of Gildan is some of their raw material costs. They are particularly exposed to the price of cotton which is a crucial uh, raw material obviously for producing the basic clothing that Gildan produce. And that leads us to our story of the opportunity that was for long-term investors back in 2010 and 2011. Now in very early 2011 cotton prices went through the absolute roof. Uh, they peaked out in early 2011 at about two US dollars per pound. That's about two and a half times the long-term average price of cotton uh, and cotton prices even got down to a low of 40 cents per pound in the financial crisis only a couple of years earlier. As is more or less always the case when a commodity price does this, it was a combination of increased demand in this case, um, particularly from China, combined with uh, supply constraints, um, notably from floods in Pakistan that caused uh, yields and production of cotton to be lower. And so in the 2012 financial year, Gildan experienced some higher costs. And if we look at some of the basic uh, financial performance from the 2012 financial year, actually their revenue grew pretty nicely. Uh, it grew about 12.9% versus the previous year, their 2011 financial year. However, even though revenue grew about 12.9%, their gross profit actually decreased 9.5%. And that decline in gross margin and gross profit profits was primarily due to increased costs, particularly relating to cotton. And as is so often the case in the stock market, a business with a good long-term track record and good future prospects was sold off by shorter term minded investors. And in the case of Gildan, it sent the stock down almost 50% from peak to trough. Now, of course, this type of analysis is much easier to do in hindsight, but let's just pause for a moment and uh, think about being back in 2012, looking at a situation that's going on here with Gildan and let's try and do some basic long-term fundamental analysis of what's happening with the company. Firstly, we have a business that grew its sales 12.9%. Revenue was up 12.9% in financial year 2012 versus financial year 2011. So we really have no major concerns with Gildan's ability to continue growing its revenue. We do, however, have an issue with gross profit and gross margins, both of which were down versus 2011. Now that, of course, on the surface of things is not a good sign to see gross margins compress so aggressively. But if we do a bit of digging into some of the reasons why we can see see that it was most notably because of this massive spike up in the price of cotton. And a big jump up in a commodity price, particularly something like cotton, is a very, very solvable issue. Now farmers are very entrepreneurial people. If cotton prices are high, uh, particularly for an extended period of time, more farmers will choose to grow cotton versus other types of crops, uh, simply because it's a good business decision. And it'll happen pretty quickly. You don't have to be some sort of expert on, uh, you know, the price production and growing of a cotton crop, a quick bit of googling that will tell you that uh, the production cycle for cotton is relatively short, it's about a six month period from planting to harvest. So some basic analysis will tell you that in a fairly short space of time relative to you know a long term view of an investment in a business, uh, this should be a pretty solvable issue for Gildan, you know, there's an old saying in commodity industries that there's never really been uh, a supply shortage and a boom in price that hasn't been followed by a glut, uh, oversupply, and then a, a big decrease in prices. And finally, the stock in absolute terms got quite cheap. Uh, it got down to about as low as 1.5 times book. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Gildan had a, a 
long-term return on invested capital in the high teens. It had a long-term average return on equity of around 20%. So if Gildan got all the way down to one times book and again had a long run return on equity of around 20%, it would kind of be equivalent to putting your money in a bank account that earned 20% interest. That's kind of how the mathematics works on that. And that of course is absurdly cheap and it's a phenomenal return. So for Gildan to get uh, even within range of one times book to get down to about 1.5 times book, it was fairly optically undervalued and it was trading about at half of the book value multiple it had traditionally traded at. But nonetheless, short term investors sold the stock off and it created a really fantastic opportunity for longer term investors. Now in terms of how it played out for investors that were willing to take a long term position in Gildan and potentially stomach some short term pain, if you had bought the stock at the beginning of 2012 and had held it for say five years just to put a number out there, uh, you would have enjoyed a 23% per year return with dividends reinvested versus 14.6% returns for the S&P 500. And in fact, if you were an investor who had bought the stock much higher before this crisis had even happened, let's say you bought it a year earlier at the start of 2011, and you simply just held on and didn't sell through uh, the general panic around the stock that was happening, uh, you actually would have also beaten the S&P 500 over a five year period. So as short term investors worried about the business's next quarter's results and their own you know, quarterly short term returns in their portfolios, uh, they sold off the stock and it created an opportunity to where long term investors who could look at the situation through a rational lens could buy a good business that was trading at a very modest valuation. Of course, they had to be willing to stomach some poorer business results in the short term and potentially some poorer stock performance in the short term. You know, the stock was down almost 50% from peak to trough, but of course it could very easily have gone lower and gone down 60 or 70 or 80%. But if you were willing to make the investment recognizing that it's a good business and that it's trading at a modest valuation and you're willing to stomach a couple of bumps and hold on to it for a few years, you would have been rewarded very handsomely. So I hope you enjoyed that story of where long-term investors can take advantage of short-term issues and situations around companies. It's a great example of what a lot of investors would call time arbitrage. And as markets get more competitive and there's many great analysts and a lot of people hunting for undervalued stocks, I think it's uh, an edge that really anyone with a long-term mindset can still have. So if you enjoyed the video and haven't subscribed to the channel already please be sure to do so and if you've got examples of what you think might be current time arbitrage type opportunities be sure to let us know down in the comments below but that's it for me for this one and i'll see you on the next video cheers